Hi everyone, my name is Reed Hedick, and I'm here with members of our community and with Mr. Ebner, one of the finalists for our police chief position. And we have some questions that have come up in the community and uh, we're gonna ask them here today. So I'm here with Aspen and Janina and we'll be asking some, some questions. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Ebner, for joining us here this today. Thank you for having me. So first question we have, it's one of, one of the generic questions here, is why are you most qualified to be our next police chief for the city of Aurora? Well, it's a great question. It's, it's one I've been asked quite a bit in the last couple of days throughout this tour, and it's a, a very relevant one. Um, I, you have to look at the person um, and their history. And if you look at me personally and my history, both as just a person growing up with going through challenges in my uh, childhood to getting into law enforcement at a very young age, I left my state in New Jersey to become a law enforcement officer in Florida because New Jersey was going through a very difficult budget crunch for, for hiring. So I left my home to go 11, 1200 miles away to pursue my dream of serving people in law enforcement. And I did that. And I moved to Florida in 1991 when I was hired as a police officer down there. But once New Jersey started hiring again in 95, I actually returned back to New Jersey to continue my pursuit of law enforcement. And throughout my career, you know, I've always put the public before myself. I, 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 to this day, I, I believe to my heart that law enforcement is the most noble profession there is because we're willing to put ourselves uh, in arm's way to protect someone we don't even know, just like the military. But, you know, with us, it's, it's really not in the military, it's in the community itself. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look at who I am and what I've done, that's important. And I know any candidate that's in this spot will do the same thing. If something happened in this studio right now, I would get up and do whatever I could to protect everyone here. Good. And that's what we want. And that's who I am <laughs> as a person, but that's who we want to attract in law sure. enforcement. Yeah. But if you look at where I've come from through my career, I've, I've gone through being a police officer in uniform to a detective, to a detective sergeant, and uh, in an agency that was going through some turmoil. Went through a 10-year consent decree, and then has come past the consent decree 12 years later and has really flourished. We become best practices. We mm -hmm. share our best practices throughout the country. And as a detective sergeant, I was sent to internal affairs. And I worked with the monitors. I worked with our development and our implementation of programs to track officer interactions with motor vehicle stops, with search and seizure, with use of force. Not many people have that experience to see a department, what it was like beforehand. For five years, I worked there. During a tenure, it was a very long consent decree, and then after. Yeah. And um, it's a cultural change in the beginning. It's, it's not easy. It's difficult. I know that by me coming here, I bring that experience. I understand the process, and um, I was uh, recommended to put in for this position based on the person that knew me who worked with me and says, you know what, you're an ideal candidate for this, Scott, yeah. and, and that's why I'm here. Um, right now, you're seeing a large influx of chiefs of police throughout the country from major cities that are just retiring, leaving, and uh, you know the average life expectancy for a chief of police is three to five years right now, and it's even less in the, in the most recent year. I want to come here. I know it's going to take some time. The consent decree is supposed to be for five years. Mm -hmm. um, ours was too. It was 10 years uh, that I worked through. Uh, I would be here at a minimum of seven to 10 years because that's how long I take to get through the consent decree to make this department much better, far beyond what the consent decree is requesting, and to be that model agency where people will be contacting the Aurora Police Department now. What did you do? How did you get through this? How did you become better at many different things? And now show them the best practices. Good. Aspen? Um, yes, that was an amazing answer. <clears throat> what is your vision for the police department and how will you improve um, trust within the police department in the community? Yes, well that's the, the, the most difficult challenge for a law enforcement professional and a leader right now in law enforcement, especially a chief of police, because you have to balance the health and well-being, health and wellness of your officers with the uh, what their responsibility is and with engaging with the community and building that community trust. And if you look at President Obama's, you know, President's Task Force in 21st Century Policing, you know, officer wellness, health and wellness is on, in there. So is, you know, building trust and legitimacy for with the community. That's what a chief of police has to do. That's a balancing act that's very important. Um, and, and, and it's one that resonates with me. I believe in officer wellness. There's many officers that come to work every day. This is a very, very difficult job. It's a stressful job when things are going well. But when you're, when you're away from home, when your kids are eating dinner, when you're not able to put them to bed, when, you're, when your wife is going to bed by herself or your spouse, because you're not home, you're working. And, and you're, you're dealing with this, plus 
the negative impact of what you see day in and day out. I'm talking terrible things that happen to great people and you have to go give bad news of what happened to them. It weighs on, on those officers. So you need to be able to, have, to help officers know that they matter. We care about them. Because just like any profession, wherever you work, if an employee is coming to work and they're not at their best because they're, they're, they're physically, they're mentally drained, they're, they're dealing with a dependency issue, they're having marital problems, are they going to be the best person to do their job, let alone interact with the public with dealing with very traumatic things? And the answer is no. So you have to build trust and morale within to know, let your officers know that they matter. They, they, they're very important, and we're going to do whatever we can to help them and make their job easier. That's our job as leaders is to set that landscape for them, to set policy up, procedures, training, so we can make their job easier, clear for them so everyone can do it. And then for us to share that trust and develop it with the public. The public, the community, the community is just not one part of the community. I mean, Aurora's made of 450 neighborhoods. Yeah. Every neighborhood has, a, has something different in their mind that they think is the most important for law enforcement and police. This makes it very difficult for us because we're constantly dealing with different areas that are important to them and we have to address all of them. Everybody's important in the community because they have to be represented by the force that's representing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Thank you. Virginia? Yeah, so tell us about your approach to reducing crime and the fear of crime. Well, the fear of crime has gone up throughout the country. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, a, it's a systemic problem. It's not just here in Aurora. It's just not here in Colorado. It's just not here regionally. If you look at the major cities throughout the country, since 2019, 2020, crime and particularly violent crime has gone up. Uh, just stolen vehicles alone, if you look at the thefts of stolen vehicles right here in Aurora, it's, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of vehicles. So how is it that I feel about... Uh, uh, yeah, your approach to reducing to crime. Approach your mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's twofold. Well, the first one is we need more officers here. That's known through within the department and, and with the community that we met with. They know that there's a staff in shortage. We need to recruit more officers that represent the community to work here. I can come in and direct people to work different areas to try and reduce violent crime, but if they're busy calling from call to call to call, and I want to be more proactive in a certain area to reduce crime, it's very difficult because the priority is we have to answer the calls. We have to serve the public when they call for help and they call 911, they need an officer there, they need an officer there quickly. So. To, to tackle that, first, we need more officers, but we have to be smart about it. We have to police smarter, not harder, just like any line of work. We have to be able to use technology to our advantage and community engagement. The most important part of police work is the prevention of crime. It's not the apprehension of criminals. It's not the punishment of people who break the law. It's, it's actually to prevent crime. How do you do that? You have to work with the community. The community has to know that they can come to you and feel safe that they can give you information to share that so we can, we can investigate it and not feel like they're going to be investigated when they're the ones reporting it. It's a very important aspect, and a lot of people uh, think it's simple. It's not. Different parts of the community, I know from, from where I am, is one of the most diverse states in the country. There's 9.2 million people in New Jersey in that small state. Some communities don't trust law enforcement because what happened to them in their country and when they immigrated here because of how they were treated and how they were raised. We have to break down those cultural barriers so we can get people to work with us not work against us, and us to work with them and not against them. It goes both ways. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, your answer goes right into this next question, but just tell us also kind of your strategy to then recruit and retain and then promote, you know, a, div a diverse police force. Well, if not only, if you look at the, uh, I, when I walked around the uh, districts and I spoke to the officers, they're losing more officers this year than they'll actually hire. Mm -hmm. So. They're down already, but they're not even able to keep up with attrition. So they're falling behind each part. So that's what we're faced with. Recruiting is extremely important, but also retaining quality officers and not lose them laterally to other departments because maybe the pay is better. Mm -hmm. Maybe because they have a better wellness program, they treat them better. Mm -hmm. um, just give them more time off benefits. I'm a firm believer in educating and education and training, but most importantly, developing your personnel. When people get hired, they need to know that they have a career ahead of them where they're going to be trained, professionally developed, and hopefully all of them one day will be sitting in this seat doing the same thing as me, if not for here, but for other departments. That would be the lasting impression you want to do with every officer, both sworn and civilian. Civilians are a very important part of the department. We need to hire more of them as well. That was another area. So it's not just sworn members, but whoever we hire has to be a representation of the communities you serve. The strongest part about police work is the diversity of the departments. 
I've made some lasting friends from all over the world that I've worked with in the departments that I have with from all walks of life, all demographics. And that's what makes us so great. Because with us, we're just working to help each other. And if we could do that, we can build upon that. So how do we recruit? When I met with all the officers, I told them, every one of you have a responsibility as well. It's not only a police officer, you're a recruiter as well. From the first one who just graduated academy, who was in the academy, to the chief himself. I'm gonna challenge every one of them to make sure that they supply an individual, a name that we can use to hopefully put forward and they can take the test and they can become an officer. But it's also the community as well. It's, it's easy for you know, people to sit back and say, well, you're not hiring diverse candidates. And I would challenge them, have you recommended any diverse candidates to us? Because I'd be happy to hire them. Now that's another issue with recruiting here for the uh, Aurora Police Chief in the department is that we, we're in charge of recruiting, but we don't have much say in who we hire. That's the Civil Service Commission. It is being addressed with the, uh, the consent decree, and that's something I would really like to partnership and work with the, with the uh, Civil Service Commission to bridge that gap, to have more input. I mean, um, we need officer input in who we hire, and just so, is, so does the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so Aurora is under a consent decree, and the three issues in the in the decree are racially biased policing, use of force, and documentation. Describe your strategies and plan to address these issues. Well, I'm very familiar with that because all three of them that are mentioned there were in our consent decree that we were under mm -hmm. for 10 years. Um, one of the most important things that people need to know, both officers that work here and the public, is that they're be treated the same for whatever their interaction is with the police, regardless of who they are. Well, that's, that's hard to, to quantify. How do you do that? You need systems in place that record these interactions and that we could document it and then we could see what's going on with officers. The consent decree mentions that and it's very important because we can implement and, and if I'm here, we will implement and we'll make sure we'll, we succeed in doing that and go far beyond that. You know, the track stop data. Who are you stopping as an officer? What was the reason for their stop? What's their race and gender? What was uh, your action? What action did you take? And then from there, we can, we can actually compare you to your peers where you work and see, if, are you deviating from that? And, and we did that with Stop That in New Jersey. We, we, did a, we built an upper and lower control matrix. So you're not compared, if you're in District 1, we're not going to compare you to officers in District 3 because it's a different community you're, you're interacting with. It's a different neighborhood. So we, can, we would compare people to where they work, to your peers. So if all four of us work together, and for some reason, I'm stopping a certain person or a certain demographic at a higher ratio than you, then we're going to look at me. We're going to look at my videos. We're going to look at my stop data. We're going to look at my arrest, and we're going to see why. Maybe it's just because Scott Emmer doesn't like people who don't wear their seatbelt, and he starts issuing people summonses for seatbelt in every one, and for some reason, he's, he's hitting higher in a certain demographic. There can be explainable reasons because we have to look at the data. We have to look at why you're interacting. What was your initial reason for the stop? What was your initial reason for that interaction? The consent decree is a roadmap to how we can address these. But the consent decree, like I said, is just a roadmap. We can go further and far beyond that and become what I would say the best practices in this region and my goal is the country. Okay, last one. Um, well, to round this all off, uh, the community does have concerns regarding police response for individuals with mental health conditions. Um, what is your plan to kind of like reform and train on that? Well, let's be clear. Um, mental illness is not a crime. And it can't be treated as one, just like addiction can't be. And the reason why we're sent and we interact with a lot of people is because one, they, multitude of reasons. It could just be because we were called there or because they're causing a disturbance outside of a business, your home, you name it. We have to go because we're called. But we could also triage these calls better through communications, through training, through having you know, clinicians maybe where we have our dispatchers sitting there so they could assist with the calls and then triage these calls. Why do we have to send a uniform police presence if really we can determine from the call that this is a mental health issue? This is someone in crisis or possibly in crisis. So there's many successful programs. I know they're doing it here in other places where you can you know, assign a clinician with an officer. The officer's there for the safety of the clinician and for the public, of course, because you just don't know what you don't know. When you're going to a call, just because somebody reports it to you on the telephone doesn't mean that that's actually what's occurring. And when they get there, the officer has to keep the clinician safe, the social worker safe if there is, or a mental health behavioral specialist that's out there as well. But for a police to respond to these calls, we know that that's not the best policing method out there. It takes resources. It takes the 
time and commitment and partnerships to build these partnerships up where we could all go in and, and a little whole government approach to, you know, this problem that is with really, there's a, there's a large problem with mental illness and addiction. And those are a lot of the calls where you see strife happens immediately when there's a police presence respond because in that individual's mind, they didn't do anything wrong. They just might be going through some episode. They might be off their medication. There's a multitude of issues and officers are coming in cold, in essence, blind, they don't know what's going on. But if they have a professional who's trained in this to come there, it really helps the situation. Yes, there might have to be police involvement because it, this person could just not want to engage this clinician. But to me, that's, that's, that's where we're moving forward. That's where Aurora needs to move forward. And that's where law enforcement in general throughout the country is, has, has moved forward. And, it's, and it's, for the, it's for the better. It's a best practice right now. So say you get the job. What is going to be your first priority? What are you going to do first? Well, I'm going to get to know the department and the, and the, and the uh, community just like yourselves here. I think that's extremely important as an outsider coming in. I'm not going to come in here day one and say I'm going to do this, this, and this and move people around. That's, that's crazy. I mean, I need, to build, I need to build support and trust both internally and externally. And how do you do that? You listen to people like yourselves who are the experts in the area, in the field, the community, and talk to them. But more importantly, as an outsider coming here, you're going to see me, you're going to see my wife. We're going to be out in the community because to me, what you do – off duty is just as important as what you do when you're wearing a uniform. It's not more so because it's when you don't think anyone's looking at you is when you need to be doing the right things. And that's what officers need to know deep down. And that's what we expect from them. So that's my first priority is, is to engage not only the department from the top down and the bottom up and everyone in between, but also the community mm -hmm. to meet those, those groups, to become close and have a great working relationship with city management, with the city council, the mayor, it seems like it's a monumental test. It's not if you're good at communicating and you're willing to listen. And at the end of the day, it's not about what I think is best. It's what everyone thinks is best, what's best for the community. That's the most important thing. And working together to get to that. Use my experience, their experience. Everyone has great experiences, and we have to come together and do that. I love that. Great. So we've run through our questions. What have we missed? What would you, what would you like the people of Aurora, our residents, to know about you, about your candidacy? Sure. Well, what I would be concerned is them is that, you know, you know, besides wanting to be here, you know, I, I don't want to, this is not a, a goal of mine to come here for a year or two to try and build a resume, to, to decide I'm going to go apply to be a chief somewhere else. That's not my goal. My goal is to come here, you know, with my experiences to really help this department, to help this community become the best organization, not only in the region, in the state, but in the country. And I know deep down I can do that. That's my goal. My goal has been throughout my career in law enforcement and as a person in general, whether I'm coaching or volunteering, is to, is to leave things better than I found it. I'm going to do that. And you know what's going to look great 10 years from now is when I see the people that I surrounded myself with, a very diverse pool of professionals, and I could see them in chief positions or in positions of public safety throughout the country and know that I had a small part of that. And so did you as the community with input. That's my goal. So thank you. Thank you for your years of service on police forces around the country. Thanks for being here and willing to put yourself out like this and being a candidate. We appreciate that. So thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thanks, yes. Aspen and Janina, you. for, you, uh, for you. your work here. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, those of you that uh, joined us today. Uh, we appreciate that. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Make sure that you stay engaged with all the things going on in the community. Bye.